Howdy folks. Welcome to the country. My name's Art Trollop. Y'all see folks. Y'all see folks. Don't know why we do things out here in the country. Well, I'm about to tell you. This is, oh my God, it's a cow. All right, everyone. Welcome back to ECE 2002. Uh, this is lecture 14. We'll be doing chapter 15 today. My name, per usual, is Art Turlop. Uh, let's get started. Oh, yeah. It's convolution day. You know what that means. Mm. Driving that train high on coke. No, what? No, 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 no. Uh, Jerry Garcia, no, we're not doing that. No. <laughs> okay. No, we are not doing that. But we are we are going to be using trades. Um, oh, man. Actually, uh, fun fact, I'm actually reading um, A Scanner Darkly right now by uh, Philip K. Dick. So I love science fiction, and, and I think... Every good scientist and engineer should should read a little bit of science fiction, uh, but it is just really depressing and riddled with uh, with drug use. It's crazy. I had no idea um, what the book was actually about when I started reading. I just knew that there's a movie somewhere. So before I watched the movie, I wanted to read the book, um, and I liked androids. Do androids dream of electric sheep so much? And I thought, well, this this ought to be good too. But apparently, um, I don't know, Philip. Philip K. Dick's later stuff is not as good. So, anyways, if you're looking for good book recommendations, uh, hit me up. I always got some good sci-fi books that I, I recommend, but uh, there you are. Um, today we're going to talk about discrete convolution. No, it's not a secret. Um, it's actually just talking about convolution when we have distinct, separate elements that were convolving, not convoluting, convolving together, Okay. So we're going to talk about what's the difference between this and, and continuous convolution. Uh, spoiler alert, there really isn't too much difference. And how do we execute a discrete convolution? What are some cheater methods that we can apply? Some sort of pseudo algorithms, if you will. Um, and what those actually mean, what those are doing in our thought process. And then if we have some time, we'll do some MATLAB examples and maybe talk about what we mean by a digital signal process. Um, and how that plays into what we're doing here. So for some of you, this chapter is going to be like muy importante. All right. Super duper important, uh, in your, in your career. For the, some of you, it, it won't matter. This will be a footnote. Um, and basically it has to do with whether or not you get into a signals processing, um, type of field. And, uh, Yeah. But you will use this tool, this discrete convolution, to do other kinds of operations. But generally speaking, um, you're not going to perform that operation too much like, uh, like we're going to show today, regardless of what discipline you end up falling into. Um, because, quite frankly, signals aren't this short. Um, these just serve as toy examples for you to get the concept of what's actually going on when you, say, program it or... Um, see what the outputs are of a program someone else wrote. So anyways, okay. So what's the difference between these two things? Um, in the continuous world, we're using integrals in the discrete world. We're using summations, uh, our infinite test, or I'm sorry, our continuous case is using infinitesimal width for our right here, down here at the bottom infinitesimal width for our little rectangles that we're summing over, right? It, it, recall that an integral is essentially just a summation over an infinite number of things that are infinitesimally small. In our discrete case, um, they actually have an integer width, right? We have a nice clear view of what these are. They, they are only so wide. Uh, they, they're Chunks. They're chunks of information. So, effectively, the continuous case is like the discrete case in disguise. Okay? And in most practical applications, I 
you know, notice practice, um, will approximate our continuous signal, our continuous feed, we have to, right, as a discrete process. So when we're developing theory, however, we have nice, clean calculus tools to be able to solve problems. So see, calculus really was invented more as a matter of convenience for dealing with a very, very, very large sum of numbers. It, that's really all it is. It's just a convenient number system that gets employed uh, with a an operation that we kind of already knew about, and uh, that is integration. Um, but convolution just builds on that same distinction between those two realms, between the continuous realm and the discrete realm. Um, for notation, it is important to note that when we write it out, we have brackets and N for our notation for the discrete world. And for the continuous world, we have parentheses and T. So hopefully... I will try to be consistent with this. You, it may not be consistent as you uh, go through other uh, parts of your education. Uh, notations change, you know, different symbols change all over the place. But by and large, I've seen most people comply with, oops, comply with this kind of notation with the brackets. That pretty much summarizes it. You can see in red here. I've, I've noted the. Uh, signal that actually comes in. And really, you can think about this signal and this signal as being the same. This one just has these infinitesimal little rectangles, right? And they just do their thing, presumably, you know, as, as continuous as they can. But these get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, I think you guys all know how calculus works. So let's go ahead and move on. All right, definition. The discrete convolution of two signals, F and G, is defined as follows. There's three ways to write this out. Oh, the first two are exactly the same. <laughs> Whoopsies. Um, so sometimes, you know, people might get sloppy and write it like this. I think that's what I intended to write. There we are. Okay. So, yeah, you might see that. Um, this or this are better. Because uh, then you've captured the whole operator. Anywho, it's just the sum from negative infinity to infinity of the same kind of format that we saw before. And instead of tau being our placeholder, now we have m as our placeholder. So n and m are both in integers. So this fancy squiggly z uh, represents all integers, right? Which is just the set. Um, whoops. All the negative one, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, etc. Okay, um, and all the theorems and rules that we had from before still apply and carry in the discrete domain. Um, we just have a sigma instead of a, a very lanky s. Okay, so let's talk about the discrete unit impulse function. Well, before, and this is called a Kronecker, by the way, Kronecker delta function. Here we have what we had from before. This is the Dirac delta function down here in this bubble. And notice that we are keeping an area of one. So when you look at this definition up here, right, you may think to yourself, okay, that's fine. Last time you told me it was zero undefined or infinite or what, whatever the heck, and zero, right? It was only defined, I guess, or undefined. <laughs> it only did something non-zero at n equals zero, t equals zero, whatever the input is, didn't matter. But it, it's weird to see that this is so much smaller than infinity, right? One is, is tiny compared to an infinite amount or this unfathomable, undefinable amount. So what the heck is going on here? Why is it so darn small compared to the its predecessor here, the, the Dirac. Well, I'll tell you, because the, the delta function isn't defined by its values, its output values, right? It's actually defined as an area. 
Uh. So if it's defined as an area, then in discrete world, I'm counting by one, a, a width of one. And therefore, if I'm counting by area, my height must match it uh, to create an area of one. So therefore, the output of dn uh, must be, and this actually should be at zero, sorry. <laughs> Let me fix that. Zero, one, two. Um, so my, my output for the delta function is just a height of one. When I was looking at the continuous world, I could get as small as I wanted to. I wanted some basic unit of measurement, my, my basic unit of measurement in width. And in discrete world, my basic unit of measurement in width is one. But in continuous world, my basic unit of measurement in width is the infinitesimal, right? We take the limit as n goes to infinity, making this these rectangles infinitesimally small. But ever shall the ratio between the width and the height remain um, a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So therefore, our height becomes one over some infinitesimal or some kind of infinity, right? Um, I want that written on my gravestone, by the way, some kind of infinity. So anyways, we want this area one. This is the only thing that really truly defines a delta function, regardless of if it's Kronecker or, Del uh, Kronecker or Dirac. It must have area one. Because this is our basic unit. One is not just the loneliest number. It's a very special number. Okay, so I have a little note here on the side. I'm giving away lots of recommendations today on uh, on books and uh, more books, actually, as it turns out. I have a, I have a big library. I, I love books, um, especially, you know, in print and stuff. I begrudgingly started using an iPad this year. Um, but there's just something about uh, printed text of people from, you know, all all ages and all times. It's It's just fascinating, so... I think Carl Sagan has uh, convinced me that books are like the best invention of, of humankind ever. Uh, so I, I love my books. Anyways, uh, we have On Numbers and Games by John Conway. So if you're interested in this concept of different kinds of infinity or how do we count to infinity and then where do we count after that? And what do we do with those kinds of numbers that are goofy as heck? And are there other numbers that behave even stranger than uh, infinitesimals and infinite numbers and how do they interact with those? Well, as it turns out, um, they do exist. They're very interesting, and you can apply them to games, to game theory, all kinds of games. Uh, if you're, you know, in computer science, you play games all the time, right? You you code uh, something, and the game is, does it work? And usually you lose, and then eventually you win the game, hopefully. Uh, and then you get to graduate at some point in time, and then you get to go play the game again somewhere else. <laughs> but... Um, it's a one player game, uh, and it sucks, <laughs> but we love it. So anyways, um, it's, it's a really good book. It talks about some really basic game theory, um, and number theory. So it's just a fantastic read if you're interested in that kind of thing. I, I recommend it, especially for the, for the comp sci folks, um, just because it, it expands how you think about numbers in general and how you can use those placeholders, which is what every number is, in a system that allows you to compute new things. So if you define relations between objects, which is all that computers really do, um, then you can use expanded number systems to define new things that you couldn't really get to before very easily. Um, so anyways, that's my bit. Uh, let's do a real example of this thing. Okay, let's talk about what we actually physically do when we um, do a convolution. Uh, I said no, Jerry Garcia. We're not... All right, driving that train. Okay, there you go, fine. All right, I, I do love the Grateful Dead. All right, so we're going to drive that train, right? Now, we need to talk about some notation real quick, though. Um, what we're going to have here is usually either, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that like that. We're either going to have an underline or we're going to have an arrow. We may sometimes have both. It may sometimes be notated. 
and that notation should read n equals zero, at least for one of them, or say something about how this number set is, uh, is arranged. The reason being is it matters where this sequence starts, right? If we don't know where it starts, we don't know when they're going to run into each other. So it's important for us to have this indicator of where zero is. Um, if you had a shift, let's say g of n plus 1, what would this look like? Well, it's actually a really simple matter. It's the same sequence, right? It's very easy to write. Okay, but where does my underline go? Um, I'll tell you. For plus, uh, it's just going to shift over this way. Now, this seems counterintuitive from uh, what you have from before, but, uh, you know, where you, you usually, to move it to the right, you want to, you know, put a negative in here, right? It's usually n minus 1 to move stuff to the right. Well, in fact, it's still consistent. What you've moved to the right is the zero placeholder. So, relatively speaking... With respect to my zero placeholder, I've actually shifted this thing to the left. Yeah? So by adding, I've shifted to the left, and uh, conversely, by subtracting, I would shift to the right. So all is right in the universe. You're not going crazy. Um, everything is good. Okay, so before what we had was at uh, n equals zero, we had five, right? Well, now for my input... In order to get 5 back out, what do I need to do? Well, I need the total input, right, to the function, to this g, to my sequence, to be 0. Well, in order for that to be the case, then for 5 to be there, n would need to be equal to minus 1, right, to get that 0 back out. So that means that this placeholder now has shifted to minus 1. So the first entry is at n minus 1. And then we go from there. So then it's n minus 1. Uh, I'm sorry, n equals minus 1. And then n equals 0. n equals 1. And n equals 2. Okay, so now let's actually convolve these two sequences together. Now that we understand what we're, what we're actually looking at and what our pointers are. So in order to do a convolution, we need to take the second function and we reverse it. And then we ram it into the other function. Easy enough. Uh, the textbook actually has a nice picture of this. Okay, so there's a typo actually in the textbook here I wanted to point out. Uh, this does f of n twice. So you need to fix that in there. I apologize. Um, so here's our two functions. We're starting on the n track, right? And let me go and switch to red so you guys can see. We're starting on the n track. And we're going to shift to the m track and ram these two things into each other over time, which our time indicator is n, right? So n equals zero, they, they smash into each other. Remember, this is just replacing our old t and m is replacing our old tau so nothing new here but the step is different right before it was kind of continuously crashing through each other now it's only crashing at discrete points here so we only have the sort of um, stem plot of where the crashing occurs right and that's at the different time steps like n equals zero n equal one etc So how do we calculate this overlap? Well, it's actually much more simple than when we had the continuous case. So for the continuous case, we had to you know, calculate this an infinite number of times effectively, right? In this case, we only have a finite number of times that we have to worry about. So when they first hit, the first two cars to hit are these two, right? Five and two. So we have their product, right? Remember, the crashing is essentially their product. And then we add all of the crashes together. So we have 5 times 2, there's nothing else crashing into each other, uh, so our convolution at n equals 0 is equal to 10, and you can see that uh, right here. So at n equals 0, we have 10. At the next time step, we have n equals 1, and now 
two trains are overlapping each other. So now we take the product again. And we're going to walk through the, the crash here. So here is the front of the G train. It's crashing into the second car of F of N. And then the second car... Let me do it in a different color. The second car of G is crashing into the first car. And so we add these products together. So 5 times 1 plus uh, 2 times 1. Or I should say um, 5 times 1 plus 1 times 2. Okay, and then we end up with 7, as you can see here. And here, all right, and then moving down to n equals two, we have three crashes going on. Now the front of the train has gotten into the third car, and the second car of G is now at the second car of F, and the third car of G is at the front of the train now. And so we multiply all of these together and then add them up. And we end up with 10 again. And it's just a coincidence that it happens to be 10 again, but there we are, right at 10. And you can see that it, it kind of gradually goes up and then comes back down. That's because we have, you know, total as much overlap as we can kind of in the middle here. And then gradually some of the train is leaving, uh, going through through the other side of F and no longer intersecting any part of F. Now this is grand and all, but generally speaking, I don't want to have to pull up my, my toy train set uh, every time I want to do a convolution, right? Um, especially if it's just a simple discrete case. So what can we do to make this more simple? Um, by the way, an important formula here that I uh, want to point out is you take the length of each train add them together, subtract one, that gives you the length of the convolution. Neat. Okay, let's write that out real quick. Okay, so that's a handy formula for you. Uh, good way to check. Okay, so coming back here, um, what can we do? Well, if we actually think about G of N here, what is G of N? G of N is actually a bunch of these, gosh darn, Kronecker Delta functions in disguise right? It's just got a mustache and like those funny glasses and the big nose. And um, just like those disguises, uh, if we take them off, we can reveal the true identity, Scooby-Doo style. Here we go. What is this? This is actually the delta function centered at zero. And we, we actually, we'll use an n here because that's more appropriate, right? Uh, times five. And then we're adding to it another delta function, which is just shifted over to the right one, and it has a height of one. Okay, so this is g of n, by the way. And then we're adding to that another delta function, which has a height of two, shifted over two. And you can see the pattern here, probably. So every signal is just a bunch of points, the constituent values of that function associated with a delta function, i.e. Um, we have the sifting theorem in action here. Very easy to see in this case because all the sifting theorem is doing is it's just saying a function is basically all of its constituent parts, all of its constituent output values multiplied by a delta function and added together. That's it. That's all, fun that's all they are. Um, so when we think about what a convolution really is, it's really a function being hit by a bunch of impulse functions. And as we'll see next time, this is why we can take the impulse response of a system and define its output for any input. Because if any function, right, if any function, let me write this down. So every function is just a sum of constants times their associated time-shifted delta functions. Okay, this is our sifting theorem at work, right? Our g of n is just a bunch of delta functions with a constant in front of it, 
um, and each one of those delta functions that we saw, saw is time shifted. So what this means is that essentially all convolutions are piecewise convolutions with a delta. And they're just added together. Okay? And so what we'll see next time is that when we define the impulse response, or i.e. we define a system by how it responds to a singular impulse, a singular delta, we can actually use that to define how it would react to any signal or any input because, again, all, oops, all convolutions, right, that we do, that we define, all of those responses to a system are just delta convolutions, okay? So keep that in mind. Don't forget about it for next time. All right, coming back to our example here, what do we have? Well, we're going to take our function and we're going to hit it with those delta functions. So we're just going to do the convolution of f with a delta function centered at zero, right? Centered at zero. So it just multiplies by five. Remember the delta function just returns back the original value. And then since we have this constant in front, it just multiplies through. And then we're going to add that to the next delta function, which is time shifted by one. So it shifts the register over. And then we multiply that by one because that's our coefficient right here. And then we add that to the previous and so on and so forth. And you can see this building the process that we had from before, right? Uh, this column here represents our crash at time n equals zero. This crash here represents how much we had at time n equals one. This, this crash here represented uh, how much we had at n equals three and so on. So by thinking about this in a different alignment, if you will, from a different perspective, we're just taking each train car by itself and crashing it through f. So we're taking each car of gn and crashing it through fn at a particular time. Well, what's happening with these cars in the back? I know the first car is hitting it at n equals zero, right? But the second car doesn't hit fn until n equals one, right? So it doesn't start until here. And the, and the third car of g doesn't actually hit f of n until the uh, and until n equals two. Wow, I got a lot of typos in here. <laughs> this should be n equals two, you know, if we don't have to count, uh, which, you know, presumably as a mathematician, I should, but I, apparently I don't. And at n equals uh, three, we finally hit it with the fourth car of G. And so that fourth car convolves and starts going through and if we add all of those crashes together, we can add them in any order we like, right? It doesn't really matter what order I add in. But if I add them all together, as long as I keep track of the timestamp of the crash, I can do it in any order. And so I end up with the final convolution in this way. So it's very easy to do this operation. All you're doing is just multiplying a sequence by a constant and then shift, multiply the sequence by a constant, shift, multiply the sequence by a constant, shift, and then add all the results together column-wise. You can do this. This is so easy. It's a very easy process. Now, in practice, you're never going to do this again unless you learn about convolution again from scratch, and then you'll have to do it all over again. Actually, uh, uh, digital signals processing, you'll probably do this once or twice, but um, there you are. Okay, so I've written some uh, cautions and observations in here. In cases where sequences are well-defined but long, uh, you should generally use some algebraic techniques, right? You use the summation equations and try to resolve it that way. Uh, sometimes our sequences uh, might be time shifted by a certain amount before you're asked to convolve them, right? We talked about that. We talked about what what a function or a sequence or a signal, it really is just a signal, guys. It's just a signal. What a signal looks like when you time shift it. And so when it time shifts, it just gives either you train a uh, little bit of a head start or a little bit of delay. Uh, three, the in the real world, you'll never be doing this, like we said. Um, you're going to be doing it computationally, which is what we're going to do next in MATLAB. And uh, so, four, um, as it turns out, uh, most 
of the time, you're not going to have positive sequences. In fact, uh, a lot of the times for digital signals processing, what you're going to end up with is zero and one or one, zero and negative one, uh, as it turns out. And this is not always true, obviously, but um, as you know, these tend to be the most frequent and easily accessible signals to be able to produce and use. Um, so your convolutions are going to be very interesting and, and you can get very, uh, very cool convolutions occurring when you have just zero, one and negative one, as a matter of fact. And these can create very, very cool filters, uh, that you can play with later on. And if anyone's interested in that sort of stuff, uh, I highly recommend, uh, Zoltowski, uh, with his digital signals processing course is very easy, very accessible course. Um, but it teaches you just a ton about what you never thought about in terms of how a signal gets processed and, and what it looks like on the other end after, um, you know, you, you start to try to reconcile what's going on with a, an input that you receive. So anyways, let's move into the MATLAB example now. And again, I do apologize for the poor audio quality here, but that's just, what we got to deal with. All right, so our first uh, function, our first sequence, our first signal is f, uh, which we're going to set equal to 2, 1, 1, 3, 4. Okay, there it is. And then g is equal to 5, 1, 2, 2. All right, and to convolve them, you just do this. Check that out. Now, I want to show you something else. What if I do convolution of G with F? What should we expect? By now, you should be familiar with what this should be. It's the exact same thing. Convolution is a symmetric operation, uh, meaning that it doesn't matter. Well, it's a commutative operation is what I should say, not symmetric. It's it, it, You can do it either way. Okay? So, no worries. Um, if we wanted to plot this, you could. Uh, you could just do a stem. I like doing a stem plot for the um, uh, for the discrete cases. So you could do a stem of uh, the convolution of f and g. And there you go. There's our 10, our 7, our 10, etc. And there's a better picture in the book. I haven't formatted this printout very well. And that's pretty much it. That's how you do convolution in MATLAB. So it's a, it's a great way to check your work. Okay, so we have a little bit of time left over. So I want to talk about um, some digital signals processing stuff for just a moment and how we can apply convolution to this. So re recall, um, I think it was last time or the time before, we talked about convolution versus cross-correlation and autocorrelation. So autocorrelation is just cross-correlation with yourself. And cross-correlation is, you know, you have the same function cross-correlated uh, to itself. And cross-correlation is just convolution, but instead of re uh, taking my train and, and flipping, flipping it across that axis, I actually just shift uh, my train over. I don't flip it at all, and I just run it through as is. So there is no uh, inversion in that, in that respect. Um, this does some other things for us, but, um, it's, like I said, primarily used for, for signal recognition. And in the case of autocorrelation, it can do some very cool things for us. So with, uh, this thing is called a Barker code. So Barker codes are very unique, uh, sequences of one and negative one. That's all they have. It's just ones and negative ones. And what they do for us is they have this idealistic autocorrelation property that anything that's not on the peak is as minimal as possible, okay? So it's less than or equal to one. It's just absolutely minimized. And so you get these very strong peaks with very small side lobes in your uh, signal uh, pattern, or I'm sorry, your uh, autocorrelation that you get back out. So this can be used in like radar applications, right? It's very, very useful for trying to isolate the direction of something. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, let's let's take an example Barker code. The, let's do uh, Barker code fn equal to 1, 1, negative 1, 1. And remember, we want to be careful here, so we're going to designate that as our starting point. Now, when we're doing 
Autocorrelation. This is non-testable material, by the way. Okay, we're not doing autocorrelation in this course per se. But autocorrelation doesn't reverse the order, right? So when we write this out with our handy dandy algorithm table, uh, we're not going to keep the same order for the coefficients on the left side. So let me explain. Uh, let's go ahead and write this out. These are my n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Anybody know how long it's going to be? Uh, I can't hear anyone because I'm pre-recording all this crap. This is ridiculous. Why am I asking questions? I'm losing my mind. Anyways, uh, it's length 4. We're convolving effectively. It's, it's a correlation, but we're convolving. Uh, a length 4 with a length 4. So it's 4 plus 4 minus 1 according to our equation. So that should be length 7. But recall that we're starting our count at n equals 0, right? So, you know, if you count 0 in there, uh, any good uh, computer scientist will tell you, hopefully, <laughs> that we're only going to go up to 6. And uh, so there we go. Uh, you know, I, I half the time will still write a 7. I, I forget all the time. Um, but anyways... With autocorrelation, what we're doing is Fn, and I like to write a little star, Fn, to designate that's autocorrelation. You can also write the convolution with the, uh, the sort of conjugate sequence thing. I, I like this notation better because then, you know, you're just performing an operation that's just differently defined. And we're going to reverse the order that we have this. So before we had 1, 1, negative 1, 1, right, times our function on the side here. But if we're doing correlation, again, not testable material, guys, okay? So don't memorize this stuff for the test. There's not going to be any autocorrelation or correlation on the exam. But if we are doing an autocorrelation, this operator, all it is is it just reverses this order, okay? So this just becomes 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Reads up like this. The butt of the train hits first right? The butt of the train hits first, then this, then this, then this, because we haven't flipped that train across the y-axis. Yeah? So that makes sense. So the, so the two trains, one just gets displaced from the other, and then we ram them together. Okay, that makes sense. Alrighty, so with that in mind, we multiply this through, etc., etc. We end up with one times the sequence starting at zero, and then we do our register shift just like we did before. So we end up with one, one, negative one, one. If I can write... And then we end up with negative 1 times that same sequence. So negative 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. And then 1 times the sequence. Shift it again. 1, 1, negative 1, 1. And finally, we have uh, the same sequence again. 1, 1, negative 1, 1. And so what you'll see when you add this down column-wise is you end up with 1, 0, 1. I'm sorry, negative 1, 4, uh, negative 1, zero, one. So this is absolutely as small as it can get in here, right? If I was to only pick a sequence of plus minus one, these values here and here are as small as they possibly can get. Uh, and as it turns out, this is symmetric here. Um, I don't think they always have to end up being symmetric necessarily. Anyways, um, the big punch here, boom, this is maximized. I've maximized my central column, and I have minimized my side lobes, i.e. I've increased the return here uh, as much as I can, and I've minimized these, these side ones. So if I have something that's coming in and I want to match it to uh, this, this guy here, so say I know what it's supposed to be, and this is what I get incoming, I should get a, as big of spike as possible right smack in the middle. So this enables me to be able to do detection a lot easier because I've minimized potential errors out here and I've maximized potential um, signal recognition. So this is, you know, why convolution and its associates, the uh, correlation or cross correlation and autocorrelation are such powerful tools. It enables us to deal with signals in a, in a new way completely that we couldn't do before at all. And now that you're seeing this kind of operation, you think, well, this is actually kind of simple, right? Um, this seems sort of trivial. Well, when you do this on a very large scale and you have computers at your disposal, now you can do correlations of very, very big things. Um, and 
with very large data sets. And so then you get into machine learning because now you can recognize very, very complex patterns or very, very complex signals. And it enables you to be able to do that recognition and then utilize different thresholds of recognition to, to designate categorization. Um, and so now you're, you're actually learning how to do something. You're teaching a machine how to do something, which is very cool. So um, anyways, uh, if you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend uh, Zoltowski's class. I think it is called 301 is the, is the undergraduate course for that. So I, I recommend it if it's not on your list and this sounds cool to you. Um, go sign up for one of those. Tell Zoltowski I sent you and uh, he'll be happy. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's 301 Signals and Systems. That's what it's called. I pulled up uh, three old codes from my uh, 538 course uh, that I took about almost two years ago now. And uh, I like these examples uh, because they showed some of the things that convolution and um, correlation can do. All right, so let's look at these Barker codes. And we just talked about these um, in the lecture. So what I want to do is actually do this in MATLAB. All right, so you can see here that I call RXX. This is typically what we... Uh, the, the, it would be R and then sub, um, subscript XX for autocorrelation is what we typically use. Okay. Um, but again, not testable just for interest sake, we're taking the convolution of X with itself, but flipping it around because remember convolution, that operation automatically flips it around. So if we flip it around again, we're undoing that automatic flipping that's occurring okay and this is a non-symmetric operation um, but in the case of uh, the things we're going to see here it actually ends up being symmetric because um, the convolution itself is symmetric about its axis so no worries on that okay so what we're going to do is we actually have a number of Barker codes here so you'll recognize this first one readily as the thing that we literally just did um, and then these are some longer Barker codes. And actually, if you look at the Wikipedia page on Barker codes, it's, it's fascinating because it actually doesn't have um, that much there. there. It doesn't go past a certain point. Um, so I encourage you to go online and take a look at it if this is something that interests you. But let's go ahead and do this. Um, I'm going to post, I think I will post all three of these online just in case you're curious. Um, just, you know. For, for funsies. Uh, and then you can look at them on the Brightspace page. Okay. And man, I just switched us over to Piazza today, uh, the day of recording this lecture. And man, am I happy with that. So I hope you all are participating in Piazza and it, and it keeps going. Um, Piazza? P Pizza? I don't know. And it keeps going even better. So I, I can't tell you guys how proud I am of uh, the amount of participation you guys have put forth in this class. It's really stunning. So good job coming together on this one. Um, it's really making this class great. And, it, and it's a lot of fun to teach when you guys are actively engaged too. Okay, so we have the autocorrelation of our first Barker code. You should recognize this right away. Remember we had uh, 1, 0, negative 1, 4, negative 1, 0, 1, right? Okay, so notice here um, there's a proportionality a little bit between the height of this, right? There's only so many 1s we can add together, and the length of this sequence. And that's because uh, the length of the sequence and the amount of overlaps that occur are going to be proportionate to each other. So the distance from here to here uh, is, in fact, if you count this, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and do the next Barker code, which is actually of length five. And these zeros here are just um, placeholders so that all of our graphics line up with each other nicely, okay? So we do that. And you can see here the overlay, um, it's just jumping up and uh, these aren't all lined up exactly where they are. You know, let me actually change this a little bit and uh, Instead of doing a hold on, I'm actually going to remove that so that it should replace it each time. Okay, here we go. So that's our first one. 
there's our second Barker code. Notice here that these are all positive. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. So they're a very interesting set. Continuing on, you can see here we still retain uh, that negative one, one interval down here at the base, and then it just keeps jumping up to seven. Very useful tool. Continuing on, we have a Barker code of length 11. There's not a Barker code for every uh, integer, by the way. Um, it just kind of goes up and then it suddenly drops off. It's a very weird um, sequence. A bunch of positive values once again. Uh, this one looks like it's of length 13, and I can tell that because this is 13, so the, the length here is going to be uh, length 13 as well. Oh, by the way, if you're ever doing this uh, uh, normally when you don't have the pause operation, I hate the way these are coded, but you can do show hidden graphic and it'll it'll pull that up. It, SHG is very useful. Uh, MATLAB, quickie uh, command. So it's probably one of my one of my favorite go tos. Um, and then if you're not familiar, this little tutorial is clear. Um, deletes everything in your workspace and then CLC will delete everything in your command window so those are those are also nice when you're just trying to clear out your crap and I actually prefer to keep this small keep my workspace kinda like this the command window right here some people like to pull out their workspace um, but uh, I've, I've known some people that only will work in the command window you really should if you do more than one or two lines uh, work in uh, a script right so uh, I, I will admit it I've seen a, a graduate students do this where they work exclusively in the command window for everything um, you want to get used to writing good scripts and the nice thing about MATLAB is it's a it's a linear programming language so any idiot can do it um, really truly you don't have to have any object uh, you know uh, programming because all your objects are just one after the other they just occur in sequence which is how we humans generally like to think. Uh, this one is a really interesting problem. So this is just a convolution and it's a discrete convolution but we're using these exponential values and and our coefficients for the exponential values are actually defined as these ratios that we've constructed. So we have this uh, ratio of these two numbers here and the a funny thing happens when we look at um, these coefficients multiplied to a to the n and, and b to the n for the other corresponding coefficient. It's the same thing as the convolution of those two put together. That's very strange, isn't it? Um, so it has like this normalization feature that emerges from it. And this is something that you would learn in say a 301 class. Um, so let's run this and, and see what we get. And then we'll kind of explain it. So the black here is, uh, as you can see right here, designated by the K. So to color something, by the way, um, here's our stem plot. We're plotting from 0 to NE, where NE is 30. So we're plotting X, or I'm sorry, um, on our X axis, we're plotting 0 to 30. And you can see that here. Let me pull up the graphic again. You can see that here, we're plotting from 0 to 30. And we're using, for our y value, we're using y, and y is defined as, in black, um, the product of the, uh, the, the two, or I'm sorry, the, the sum of the two powers. So these are these kind of exponential decaying functions that are, that are uh, being brought together. But what's interesting is that the next plot is in red, and it overlaps completely, and it's actually a um, convolution of those two without the coefficients and you can see that they uh, line up perfectly with one another so very cool thing and you can imagine what this would be useful for in trying to identify um, a particular uh, function um, there's some other things you can do but we won't get into that here in this class so this is just a little gravy for you guys um, and I'll post this up on Brightspace um, this was a, an assignment I had and, and I'm not going to dig into the details or anything like that um, by the way, anytime you write a script, always notate when you wrote it, who wrote it, what it was for, and everything else. Because, you know, you, you share stuff, you throw it around, 
no one actually deletes this usually and so it creates a nice uh, written history of what's going on in your in your scripting it's very good even if you don't take any notes in here always put something at the beginning so that you know what the heck you're looking at each time because I don't know about you but I name stuff and my names are just garbage um, they don't make any sense after a while because I, I know what they are at the time and then I come back to it six months later and I'm like oh no what the heck was I doing so name stuff nicely but more importantly put stuff up here okay so this is just gonna look kind of like a bunch of random stuff and that's okay but what I really want you to glean from this is the ability to recognize something from a noisy signal using convolutions okay and that's all that this is this is gonna do so let me pull up this script here too um, just so you can see what what the gears are underneath here so in this one what we're doing is um, I guess I'm not gonna post this one because it has like a bunch of garbage that uh, you don't really need um, let's see here, convolution. So you can see here that we're doing a bunch of different kinds of um, cross correlations and convolutions. It's actually um, being used to identify certain things. And then what we're also doing is applying a noise to some kind of signal. And then we're, we're analyzing it. So let's go ahead and take a look real quick. So what this, these graphics here are actually representing, this is the, in blue, what you're seeing is the original signal, and then Y is the signal that has a noise applied to it. So if you can imagine, um, you're receiving just YN. Oof. Um, how do I even recognize it? Well, as you saw from before, um, they're fairly easy to recognize, as a matter of fact. Um, they plop right out. Uh, when I when I run them through this correlation and so convolution is at work and it finds exactly where it belongs it's wonderful here again you can start to pick out you might you might have gotten this confused with something down here but it's pretty unlikely this is probably where it occurred right here at 20 here's a shorter sequence with a lot of noise And so you can just see kind of how um, how this is working. All right, that last one there was um, a little too noisy, right? Couldn't quite pick it out. So anyway, that's some of the things you can do uh, with convolution, a discrete convolution, a digital signal process, if you will. Um, hence the title of the chapter. I love digital signals processing. So um, this is. This is a great field. So anyways, uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed the extra little tidbits today. And uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, or talking to myself next time, actually. Uh... <laughs> oh, hey, we have, a, we have a quiz tomorrow, too, by the way. So don't forget about that, if you're watching these in order. Okay. <laughs>